fine silver, and this is Mimi fine silver, and we are with Everlasting Life uh, Outreach. And Everlasting Life Outreach is putting this, is producing this debate or this dialogue. And um, Everlasting Life Outreach will put on other debates, other dialogues with um, larger facilities. And uh, in the future, there. What I just want to say, we talked to many of you who have called in and made reservations, and it has been so wonderful to talk with you because it's been um, a wonderful time of just sharing with you who you were and uh, just your excitement about coming here too. And again, we thank you for coming, and we do want to get on with the debate as I'm sure you do. But there's one thing we do have to also do is thank you, thank very much all the volunteers, everyone you see with an Everlasting Life Outreach t-shirt. And we can thank you guys. And now we're going to introduce Charlie Halloran, and he's going to be the moderator for tonight. And everybody turn off your cell phones. Sometimes you have to physically take out your cell phone and make sure it's going to be on vibrate or silent. So, again, we want to have the, the least amount of interruptions tonight and, and to be all ears uh, to what is going to be conveyed, the ideas, uh, the concepts, the arguments that will go forth tonight. And, and again, it's, a, it's an honor to be here, to have a front seat view, uh, to see the freedom of speech and the dialogue that's going to be exchanged tonight. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, in addition to silencing the cell phones, we do ask that no pictures would be taken. Um, a DVD presentation of tonight's debate will be available in the near future, and I just want to be sure to mention that. Also, hopefully as you came in, you received one of these programs, and if you have the time, if you would take a few moments, and there's a survey inside, and if you would fill it out, uh, that will help future debates and future dialogues. And we just ask that you would turn that in uh, after the debate as well. Um, as you notice tonight, uh, there is no charge for coming in. They purposed that that would be the format. Uh, but if you wanted to help offset some of the expenses, uh, there is a donation box in the foyer. Uh, and please uh, contribute would, would be greatly appreciated. Tonight, uh, we are blessed uh, to have two very different speakers, uh, and yet two speakers who uh, have studied and who have prepared, uh, who have debated on this very important topic that we look at this evening. Some of you might be saying, what will the format be this evening? What will be the setup? How is this going to unfold throughout the evening? Some of you are just thankful that we've started. <laughs> the format for the evening will be as follows. Uh, it was decided that Dr. Brown would be the first speaker, and then Rabbi Silver would follow him. The first round will be 20 minutes each presenting their vantage point and their viewpoint of Jesus. Following the 20 minutes each, each speaker will have 10 minutes to prepare further arguments and further ideas and further information on their viewpoint. After that time period, uh, Rabbi Silver and Dr. Brown will have a 20-minute dialogue to exchange back and forth uh, in the world of ideas and the concepts and their viewpoint of Jesus. Following the dialogue, this is where you will be able to enter in. And uh, though we don't have the latest technology where you can text questions and ideas, we do want to give you the format to my right and to my left, there are microphones. And we want to give you the opportunity to ask a question. I do need to let you know this. Because of videotape copyrights, to ask a question is to sign away rights to your presence on the video. So it kind of uh, is part and parcel tonight. Uh, to ask a question is to give your permission to be recorded. So I do want to let you know that. And there's some uh, clipboards close by to the microphones. But during the debate, maybe there's going to be a question that will come to mind. And I encourage you. Write it down on a piece of paper, and then as you have opportunity, you can direct your question to each of the speakers of your preference. Following the 30-minute Q&A from the audience, you, we will have five minutes of closing. Dr. Brown will close with his arguments, 
for the final five minutes, and then Rabbi Silver will present his final words. We are honored to have the presence of these two men with us, and just to give you a little bit of a background information about Dr. Brown, he holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University. He served as a visiting or adjunct professor in numerous theological schools, namely Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Fuller Theological Seminary, Denver Theological Seminary, the King's Seminary, Regents University School of Divinity, Southern Evangelical Seminary, and Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's the author of 20 books, including Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, The Tragic Story of the Church and the Jewish People, which has been translated into 12 languages. His highly acclaimed five-volume series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, and a commentary on the book of Jeremiah, found in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He's a contributor to the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, the New International Dictionary of the Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, and the Semitic Journals, M-A-A-R-A-V, and Ugarit Forschungen. Dr. Brown is the host of the Jewish Outreach documentary TV series, Think It Through, played on the Inspirational Network, and host of the daily syndicated talk radio show, The Line of Fire. National and international speaker on themes such as spiritual revival and cultural reformation. He has debated Jewish rabbis, counter missionaries on radio, TV, and on college campuses, and is widely considered to be the world's foremost messianic Jewish apologist. The background for Rabbi Silver is as follows. At the age of 36, Barry was ordained a rabbi to follow his father, and he received additional ordination from the Rabbinical Seminary International in New York in 1998. As rabbi of Congregation Lador Vador, Barry continues his father's efforts to build bridges between people of all faiths and beliefs. Barry performs Jewish and interfaith weddings and life cycle events. He lectures at Palm Beach Community College. He served as a columnist for the Boca Raton News, is the founder and co-chair of the Palm Beach County Environmental Coalition, and is an advisor to Jewish vegetarians of North America. An active Save Darfur Coalition member and works with other public interest groups. Barry also has a law office where he practices public interest, constitutional, environmental, animal rights, and personal injury law. Among his legal victories, the following are included. He successfully defended abortion clinics from blockaders, defended a former Marine's right to fly the flag at his home. He helped protect a sacred Native American site and for the past seven years has defended Westgate's tabernacle's right to follow its Christian mandate to house the homeless free from government intrusion. He is included in the who's who of American law for his significant contributions to the betterment of society. In 1996, in his spare time, Barry was elected to the Florida House of Representatives and was named the most effective environmental legislator and consumer champion. Barry is married to Francine Silver and is the proud father of two environmental activists, Barry and Brandon Silver. And it is without further ado that I welcome Dr. Brown at this time. Good evening, folks. Mike okay? All right, hang on. Maybe just be a little bit better. Is that good? All right. Um, thanks so much for coming. Rabbi Silver, thanks for your participation. I did know about the Jewish vegetarian part, so I apologize for eating a hamburger today, but it may happen again. Uh, you don't need my forgiveness. Or God's. 
That's a profound comment that he already made, so I think we're more in sync. I do not need Rabbi Silver's forgiveness. All right. Um, the debate tonight is not who between the two of us is more clever or a more accomplished speaker. Hopefully, we'll, we'll both be articulate in what we say. The question is, who is Jesus? Just one moment of background. I'm a Jew from Long Island, born in New York City, raised on Long Island. My dad was the senior lawyer in the New York Supreme Court. I was playing drums in a rock band after being bar mitzvah in a conservative Jewish synagogue on Long Island. I got caught up in the whole counterculture scene of the 60s. There's a saying about the 60s, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. Some of you understand that. Anyway, in the midst of the 60s, I got caught up in the whole counterculture days, became a heavy drug user, and uh, was uh, dramatically transformed at the age of, of 16. My story is literally from LSD to PhD. And uh, I'm profoundly grateful to God's mercy. So uh, here's what we want to look at. If we're saying, who is Jesus, we first have to ask the question, who was Jesus? And the question behind that is, was he? <laughs> did, did he literally exist? And, and we can absolutely say that out of all the figures in the ancient world, there's as much, if not more, attestation to the historicity, to the historical reality of Jesus. You may not know this, but the best attested book in the ancient world is what we call the New Testament, which comes from the New Covenant writings that the prophet Jeremiah spoke of, a New Covenant. The best attested book in the ancient world is the New Testament. And, and here's what some leading world-respected scholars have to say about historical background. Professor N.T. Wright, we know for certain that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. That is one of the most secure facts in the history of the world. F.F. F. Bruce, these are world-renowned scholars. The historicity of Christ is as axiomatic for an unbiased historian as the historicity of Julius Caesar. If any of this is disputed in my rebuttal time, I'll get into detail the testimony of Roman historians. Even the Talmud itself attests to Jesus being crucified, and it even it ties the Sanhedrin in with that decision, interestingly. Um, as we get into the presentation, if questions are raised about the reliability of the New Testament documents, how sure we can be, are there contradictions, I'm happy to set the record straight during my rebuttal time. Next, who Jesus was not. Just to clarify this, because not everyone knows this growing up in a Jewish home, he was not the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Just want to clarify that. I have Jewish friends that grew up thinking he was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. So maybe you just learned something tonight. I'm glad to give you the information. He was not the founder of a home and garden, entirely Gentile, Sunday morning only religion called Christianity. And he's certainly not the head of an apostate religious organization that persecuted and killed Jews in his name. So that's who he was not. Who was he? Who was Jesus? Later in my talk, closing remarks, I'll talk about who he is in an ongoing way. But first, who was he? Well, he was Yeshua. We get Jesus through the Greek coming into English, but his name was Yeshua. He is Jewish. His mother's name, you may think it was Mary, is Miriam. Mary is just the way we get it from uh, Greek into Latin into English, but her Hebrew name was Miriam. Yeshua, the son of Miriam, nice Jewish boy, quite unusual, but nice, called Christ because Christ is the Greek way of saying Messiah. So just to clarify, when someone says Jesus Christ, what they're really saying is Yeshua, the Messiah. That means he's the most influential Jew who ever lived. Next time you, you hear people talking about B.C. or A.D., think to yourself, hey, one of our boys made it. I mean, this is, this is world history being divided uh, when a Jew named Yeshua came to the world. Not only that, but based on the historical documents, he's the first man ever to be called rabbi. In recorded history, he is the first man to be called rabbi. In his generation, it was an honorific title. It was a title of honor and respect. It was not a formal ordination yet. That came about a generation later. Which means not only was he the first man to be called rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua, but he is the most famous rabbi of all time. I mean, right off the bat, you may realize, wow, I've had some misconceptions about him, which is understandable. He is the one who brought the knowledge of the God of Israel, the one true God, to hundreds of millions of Gentiles, hundreds of millions of going. What's one of a job, the jobs of a rabbi? A rabbi teaches people about God. Rabbi Yeshua has brought hundreds of millions of people around the world 
They've, they've turned away from worshiping idols and other gods and now worship the one true God, the God of Israel. And, and remember that God promised our forefather, Abraham, Abraham, that through his seed, the entire world would be blessed. It's happening in an unfolding way through Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. You also may not realize this, but, but he was really a radical reformer who planted seeds of change in society. You know, you think of people like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King that were these social reformers. They looked to Jesus for their example. This is what Gandhi said. The example of Jesus suffering is a factor in the composition of my undying faith in nonviolence. Martin Luther King said, was not Jesus an extremist for love? You see, he reached out to the outcast. He reached out to the ones that society marginalized. That's why the religious establishment had a problem with him, and that's why it still has a problem, whether, whether it's Christian religious establishment or Jewish religious establishment. Jesus came to reach out to the marginalized, the disenfranchised, not to build some kind of political power base. He was not a political messiah. Those who were waiting for him to rule and reign and crush Rome, that was not how he was going to change the world. It was going to be through suffering love, not through a sword, that he changed the world. Gandhi said this about Jesus. He was a man who was completely innocent. He offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom of the world. It was a perfect act. This was a Hindu who recognized this. Why was it that the message of Jesus spread so rapidly in the ancient Greco-Roman world? One reason was because it was so egalitarian. It lifted up the status of women. It called men to live by the same moral standards that it called women to live by. This was revolutionary. It raised up the status of the poor. It ultimately planted seeds in society that led to freedom and liberation of the slaves. Yet there were many people that used the Bible to justify slavery, but in British history, it was Christians following the scriptures that led to the abolition of slavery in England, and it was Christians holding to the, the, the biblical teaching of Jesus that led to the abolition of slavery in America, and the civil rights movement started in churches. Why? They were following the world-changing message and method of Jesus. We need to rethink who he is and how he operated. So in that sense, he was a totally nonviolent, counter-cultural revolutionary. He came to challenge the status quo. He, he came to challenge the power bases of that day and the religious establishment of that day. He spoke about what? The kingdom of God. Not in the religion, the kingdom of God. And he, he talked about a new and better kingdom coming. That's the talk of a spiritual revolutionary. Here, here, here's something I found fascinating. It was spoken by a socialist in the 1920s. He said, we socialists would have nothing to do if you Christians had continued the revolution begun by Jesus. A whole different way of looking at it. He's also the greatest prophet in Israel's history. You say, well, how can we know for sure if his words are accurately recorded in the New Testament? If that's really what Yeshua said, you know, the New Testament says that he spoke and said the temple would be destroyed in Jerusalem. How do we know he really said it? Well, the New Testament also records that he said that our Jewish people would be scattered from Jerusalem to all nations. He also said that Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles for a long period of time. And then he also spoke of returning to a Jewish Jerusalem. How did he know that? Wherever you date the New Testament, how is it that these words are recorded well before they actually happen? Because he's the anointed prophet, and God reminds us in the Torah of Moses in Deuteronomy in the 18th chapter to take heed and listen to what the prophet of God has to say. He was a religious teacher like no one else who ever lived. These words are recorded in Matthew 24, 35. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Fascinating, this obscure Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, who, who never traveled in his entire life, the distance that many of us travel to and from work every day, never wrote a book himself or raised up an army, this extraordinarily influential Jewish rabbi, do you know that his words are the most translated words of any human being who ever spoke on the planet? Amazing. People around the world cherish the words of this Jewish rabbi. It connects them to God. You know, the, the New Testament records that, that sometimes the crowds would come. They were so enthralled with his teaching. They were so enthralled with his teaching that they would, they would have to, he'd have to push out to a boat because the crowds would try to gather around him and they would almost crush him just to hear him teach. 
And even critical scholars recognized that he had a reputation for healing and miracles. Interestingly, in Talmudic literature, in Tosef de Chuli in the second chapter, it attests to his followers having healing powers. Fascinating. He's a mystic who disclosed the secrets of the kingdom of God. You may be into Kabbalah or other things and spiritual mysticism. Wait till you read the secrets of the kingdom given by Yeshua. He's the great high priest who bore our sins. The death of the righteous atones. You may not be familiar with the Jewish tradition that says, Mitatan, Shotzadikin, Techaper. The death of the righteous atones. A rich Jewish tradition. The Talmud even records that the death of the high priest atones. Jesus, the Messiah, was a priestly king in accordance with Psalm 110 and Zechariah 6 and other passages in the Hebrew Scriptures. He did not just come to rule and reign, but to carry our sins. Look at what it says about him in Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. But he, Yeshua, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He's the one who fulfilled what was written in Moses and the prophets. Hey, there's no more temple standing. There are no more sacrifices. Why? He brought it to completion. That which the sacrifices pointed towards, because God ultimately didn't want the blood of bulls and goats. The sacrifices pointed towards a greater, higher sacrifice. He took our guilt as a perfectly righteous one and said, Father, forgive them. As we turn in true shuva and true repentance, God forgives and has mercy on us. He fulfills Israel's destiny. That which Israel was purposed to do, he fulfills. And I want you to consider this. I want you to consider. The essential prophecies that had to be fulfilled, you say, I don't know when those prophecies are dated. I don't know if Isaiah really said this or not. Fine. At a certain point, a few hundred years before the time of Jesus, the, the scriptures known as the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, were completed. And it spoke of certain things. That this one, this messianic figure, would be rejected by his own people. He would then become a light to the entire world after which his own people would receive him. That sounds quite familiar to me. It also lays out that momentous redemptive acts had to take place before the second temple was destroyed. We can establish that through Haggai 2, Daniel 9, and Malachi 3. Before the second temple was destroyed, what was that? In the year 70 of this era. The Messiah came just when he had to. He fulfilled the first part of his mission, and he will fulfill the rest of his mission when he returns. It is ongoing through the earth. He's the only possible candidate. If he's not the one, there never will be a Messiah. There never will be world redemption. He's also the Son of God par excellence. The people of Israel in the scriptures are called God's Son. The, the Davidic king was called God's Son. He's the Son of God on an entirely different level. And here's a problem he solves. How does the invisible God touch human beings? How does the invisible, transcendent, untouchable God interact with us face to face? The, the, the Zohar, the Kabbalistic mystical literature talks about ten spheros, ten divine emanations by which the invisible God touches earth. There, there are other traditions, the Memra in, the, in, in, in Aramaic, which is the word, God's expression, which, which stands between him and human beings, you could say, to simplify the concept. He is the word made flesh. While God remains enthroned in heaven, sitting and ruling the universe, because God is not a man, the scripture is very clear on that. While God remains enthroned in heaven in his complex unity, he comes and manifests himself in our midst through Jesus Yeshua. Someone said it's like God with a human face. You want to know what God's like? You want to know his heart? You want to understand him? You want to come into personal relationship with him? Look at Yeshua and you see the very image of God in human form. Let me say this as I, as I come to a close. Based on this evidence, we see that he's the Messiah of Israel. And at every point I make, I can expand if we have an hour, two hours, ten hours, twenty hours. It's that rich. It, it, it's, it's that infinite in terms of wonderful truth. He's the Messiah of Israel. Because he's the Messiah of Israel, he's therefore the Savior of the whole world. Because Israel's call is to be what? A light to the nations, to bring the knowledge of God to the ends of the earth. He fulfills our destiny. You ever notice at the Olympics, one person wins, but they play the national anthem of the country? Yeshua's triumph, his death, and then his resurrection from the cross means that Israel's anthem is being played because he fulfills our destiny. You say, yeah, but I, I, I kind of thought Messiah was just going to be a political king and destroy our enemies and, 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 and crush, crush the, the power of Rome and all of this. Well, at the end of the age, the scriptures record 
that he will return and establish his righteous kingdom fully on the earth? Can I ask you a question? Who do you relate to? What's our Jewish history like? How much rejection have we suffered? How much misunderstanding have we suffered? Some of you here are, are your, your family were lost in the Holocaust. Others have vivid memories of anti-Semitism growing up. Rather than thinking of Jesus as the enemy, rather than thinking of him as some outsider, he's the one that we can relate to and that can relate to us. You read Psalm 22, for example, the Psalm of a righteous sufferer. You read the words, and when you're reading it, whoever it originally spoke of, and some of the rabbis said it speaks of Israel through history, you read it again, you say, whoa, that's, that's a picture of the Messiah. That's a picture of the one who suffered. He, he suffered unjustly. He suffered hatred, accusation, misunderstanding, just like many of you have, except he was perfectly righteous and innocent. Then he's delivered from the jaws of death. And what happens as a result of that? Read Psalm 22. I'm, I'm giving you text so you can study, check. We've got resources you can get to. Uh, later in the night, I'll give you my website, which has lots of free ref, uh, uh, resources you can download and listen to and read. But when you read Psalm 22, here's a righteous sufferer, delivered from the jaws of death, and as a result of his deliverance, what happens? There's praise to God throughout the entire world. That never happened with anybody in history in the days of King David or our forefathers. But it happened with Yeshua. Because he, the ideal righteous Jew, bore our sins. Yes, God calls on us to turn to him in repentance. In fact, we are called to higher standards. Yeshua said, I did not come to abolish the Torah or the prophets, meaning the Hebrew scriptures. I came to bring them to fulfillment. So he takes the ethical and moral requirements of the Torah and brings them to an even higher level. And then he takes everything it was pointing to in terms of priesthood, sacrificial system, temple. Remember, we've not had those functioning for almost 2,000 long years. What does he do? In one act, his death on the cross, he brings it to fulfillment. He came when the Messiah had to come, which is before the destruction of the second temple. Anybody after that can't be a candidate. So either he is, or we'll never have a Messiah, and there'll never be redemption for the world. Not only so, he died, as the scripture said he would die, rejected by his own people. Those very prophets also spoke of him extending life. How does one die and yet extend life? It is commonly called resurrection. Just as the prophets were told, I can give you text for each one. I can defend this as the best reading of the text in each and every case. And then, again, rejected by his own people, then becoming a light to the nations. You say, where do you find that? The prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, laid out clearly. And his mission to the world laid out clearly in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. These are all texts you can study. You can even study Zechariah, the 12th chapter, and see how there will be national mourning and repentance in Israel when they recognize that their king, the Messiah, is actually Jesus, Yeshua, who was crucified. He's not your enemy. He's the one who laid down his life on your behalf so that you could be forgiven, so you could be washed, so that you could be cleansed. Just a couple more comments, and I'm done. If an attack is made on the truthfulness of the New Testament, well, how do we know that, look, there's a contradiction here, or I don't know about those sources. Let me point out first, that for those of you that are Jewish and followers of the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, for every one contradiction or problem or textual issue that someone can raise about the New Covenant writings, you can raise two or three or five about the Hebrew Scriptures, and 10 or 20 or 30 about the Talmud. Which means that the issue is not who can find a contradiction, but how, in a scholarly way, do we evaluate the evidence? And when we evaluate the evidence, here's what we'll see. The Hebrew Scriptures clearly pointed to Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. There can be no other. The New Testament documents, New Covenant writings, clearly record his life, death, resurrection. We have a reliable witness. And he gives an invitation, come to me all you who are labored, heavy laden, I will give you rest. When we come to the end of the night, I want to talk to you about who he is in a living way today, the transformation I personally experienced. But first, we give you the evidence. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here, and I thank you all for coming. 
And I thank uh, Mark and Mimi Feinsilver for organizing this. This should be a colorful debate. We got silver versus brown. <laughs> and I want to thank you for reading that introduction that you read just the way my mom and my wife wrote it for you. I appreciate that very, very much. <laughs> Um, I also was pretty active in the 60s, even though I was a, just a kid. I had a kind of different path. I formed an environmental group, and I was uh, turned vegetarian. I became an uh, anti-war poster. So it's interesting how the 60s can shape people in different ways, and it's interesting how the Bible can shape people in different ways. My father used to say that we don't so much read the Bible as the Bible reads us. And what we take out of it is very interesting as far as telling us something about ourselves, perhaps. I want to thank Rabbi Tobia Singer, Carl Sagan, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and some incredible authors who have done so much to try to blow away the archaic and hurtful notion that the words of the Bible are literally true. It's a very important topic to talk about. Jews have been forced to talk about it in the past. I'm glad to be here in the US of A where I can say what I want. If I offend you, I apologize, but I think it's important that the truth is able to get out. I enjoy representing Westgate, and I enjoy working with Christians, millions of whom are inspired by the life, as they understand it, of Jesus and cherish that life. I oppose and will fight against those who celebrate his death, because his death was given significance by pagans who tried to paganize Judaism, and that is something that Judaism should have nothing to do with. We also, as far as trying to figure out who was Jesus, there's no possible intelligent person who can say they know who Jesus was. The, the records are absolutely horrible. It's so presumptuous for anyone to ever say, I know Jesus, I have a relationship, I, I work with Nobody could possibly know him because the records are terrible. The proof of Jesus is about the same as the proof of uh, the Wizard of Oz. There is virtually no historical evidence whatsoever except for a few forgeries. Anyone who says otherwise is whistling in the wind. I will read a few quotes since I didn't know I'd have to respond to this about the historicity. And I think Dr. Brown has proved my point about this by Benjamin Franklin. He said, the way to see faith is to shut the eye to reason. John Adams said, the divinity of Jesus has made a convenient cover for absurdity. Nowhere in the Gospels do we find a precept for creeds, confessions, oaths, doctrines, and whole cartloads of other foolish trumpery that we find in Christianity. Thomas Jefferson said, shake off all the fears of servile prejudices under which servile minds are servilely crouched. Fix reason firmly in her seat and call on her tribunal for every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there be one, he must approve of the homage of reason rather than blindfolded fear. The truth, he also said, the truth is the greatest enemies of the doctrine of Jesus are those calling themselves the, the truth is that the greatest enemies of the doctrine of Jesus are those calling themselves the expositors of them, who have perverted them to the structure of a system of fancy absolutely incomprehensible and without any foundation in his genuine words. And the day will come when the mystical birth of Jesus by the supreme being as his father is, is looked upon in the womb of a virgin will be classed with the fable of the birth of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Thomas Paine said, whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the relent, unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we call it the word of a demon than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. Dr. Brown is somewhat accurate. There's more there's inconsistencies in Jewish scripture because it's a bigger book, so you'll find more. But the Christian scripture made the mistake of having four different gospels, and it is riddled riddled with contradictions. If you don't believe it, read this book by C. Dennis McKinsey. I could stand up here for a thousand hours and tell you 10,000 contradictions in the Bible. But we don't have time to go into all that. I'll go into a few. Thomas Paine says, the Christian system of faith, it appears to me as a system of atheism, a sort of a religious denial of God. Carl Sagan said, we can understand why priests might make myths about superior beings who inhabit the skies and give directions to human beings on how to order their affairs. Among other advantages, such legends permit the priests to control the people. And St. Jerome said in the fourth century about the different books that were circulating about Jesus, they had to take a vote to figure out which ones they were going to accept as God's word. He said, these are not versions, but perversions. 
Jesus, if he did live, was probably a wonderful, great Jewish liberal who was persecuted and tortured and martyred by Rome, just like millions of Jewish people have also been. Unfortunately for Jesus, even after his death, they weren't finished with him because they perverted his words, twisted what he said, corrupted his message, defamed his name, and turned him into an unholy ghostwriter for anti-Semites throughout history, including Adolf Hitler, who quoted from the Christian scripture in order to get people on his side. What a terrible desecration of a great Jewish teacher, if he was remotely like described in Christian scripture. Uh, Paul, the architect of Christianity, said that he was all things to all people, and so he made Jesus all things to all people as well. Jesus said a lot of contradictory things. The way you read him is like a Rorschach test. Whatever you see in him is probably what's already in yourself. Some see hate, some see love, Nobody sees Jesus, because Jesus is not with us right now. People see a, a mental construct of what they imagine he was. Uh, Dr. Brown says, well, the proof that Jesus, uh, his name is all over, that's a, that's a great thing. So is Madoff's name. That's not a great thing. He was Jewish. Jesus' name has been used to kill more people than any other name in the history of mankind. That is not such a positive thing. It has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus, nothing to do with who he was, nothing to do with Judaism. It has everything to do with some very, very corrupt, malicious people who manipulated a great Jewish leader and twisted his words to cause horrible things to happen. If he was alive today, he would he'd be reviled in horror at what people are doing in his name. tell you if there was a Jesus, he was probably liberal. It's incredible that all the fundamentalists all line up on the conservative side. How is it that they all march with the same drummer and ignore all the liberal stuff and focus in on the conservative stuff? How is it that all the fundamentalists never notice? He said, sell all your possessions and give them to the poor and become an acolyte. If that's what he said and God said, why don't they do that? He said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Guess that leaves out Robertson and all those fundamentalist ministers, doesn't it? He said, those who live by the sword die by the sword. Why are they all support against gun control and for militarism? Why do the Christian fundamentalists say that we should fight back against people who are trying to destroy us? I think we should. But that's not what Jesus was saying, apparently. Turn the other cheek. Why is it that the fundamentalists are all trying to bring the Ten Commandments everywhere and praying wherever you see them? When Jesus said, and when thou pray, don't be like the hypocrites for they love to stand in the synagogues, but go into the corner of your closet and pray. Why don't they notice those words? Dr. Brown is a great scholar. Very, I, I have tremendous respect for his intellect. But he can't be objective. He can't possibly be neutral. He cites in his books hundreds of different passages, and every time he finds a problem with it and reconciles it to his benefit. That's astounding. That defies all logic and reason and the odds of probability. But I can't blame him. If I thought that if I even have a doubt about the validity of the Christian scripture that I'd be sent to hell, you better believe I'd be making sure that I could reconcile these things too. And I would be trying to pretend that I'm being fair, but I know going in, I'm never going to find any passage anywhere that refutes what I'm talking about. Because that would send me to hell. So he cannot be objective. If you take a scientist and he's paid by a company to do some research, the whole study is gone because his objectivity is destroyed. Well, what do you think is going to happen to someone who thinks that heaven and hell depends on their, what their conclusion is? They can't possibly be objective. And by, objective, and by the way, this... Uh, this construct that he has about a God, this is not a Jewish God. He says that he wants Jewish people to accept him. The Jewish people will never, ever, ever accept a vision of a God who would send even one person to eternal torment, let alone 99% of humanity. That is an evil, malicious, sadistic monster, and Judaism and Jews will have nothing to do with him. I could fear such a God, but I would never worship such a God, and you could never convince me to do it, no matter how many passages you cite, because it's irrational. Not only that, no Jewish person who's really Jewish could possibly enjoy his version of heaven. That is not a Jewish heaven. <laughs> a Jewish person is commanded to feel something for the stranger and for the poor and the neglected. 
If people were really being sent to hell, including, I think Dr. Brown believes 90% of the people, if, if their parents are there, if, if their friends are there, if even anybody's there, but if most of humanity is suffering in, in hell, and they're one of the select few, how could they possibly enjoy themselves? A Jewish person is incapable of enjoying themselves in such a place. This is not a Jewish version of heaven. It is a vile place where people are taught to enjoy yourself and forget about the suffering of others. A Jewish person would do what Moses did when Moses was told by God, I'm going to destroy the Jewish people and save you. He said, no, don't do it. That's a bad system. Destroy me. When Abraham was told that God's going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, no, let me save them. Let me find 50 or 10 good people. No Jewish person could just sit back mildly like the fundamentalists do and just make some pathetic efforts to try to convince a few people, knowing full well that most people are going to damnation. They would be praying with, to God to change his mind. And if there was any Jew in heaven, they would be fighting with God bitterly every single day for eternity to get God not to punish these people, including their parents, forever. There would be no peace in hell. And that's why maybe Revelation says there was a war in heaven. Read it. Revelation 12, 7. Revelation 19, 4. There was war in heaven and armies. How could that be? Well, if you have faith, you don't have to worry about it. You'll, you'll read Dr. Brown's book and he'll rationalize it away. But if you're rational, you'll say, that doesn't make any sense. In Deuteronomy 13, 1, it says that if there arises a prophet among you and he gives you a sign or a wonder and he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known. Let us, live, let us serve them. You, should, you can't follow that person. He's not, that's what Jesus did. What about 13, 1? I guess there's a rationalization for that too. Dr. Brown doesn't have faith in Jesus alone. He has faith in Paul. He's the one that created Christianity. He has absolute blind faith that everything that Paul did somehow was okay, and everything that Constantine did was okay when he created Christianity. Constantine convened, convened a, a, a group of people together, handpicked by him to support his position, and said, now we're going to vote on all the books of the Bible. We're going to vote on what the creed is, and he decided by vote and by his power that Jesus must be God, ignoring what God said, or what Jesus said, and just going with that. It is clear that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to end suffering, bring Jews back to Israel, and reconstruct the temple and have everything, no death. Jesus did the opposite. The temple was destroyed. The Jews were dispersed. There was more suffering than ever. He suffered. That's the opposite of the Messiah. I don't care how many obscure verses you could find about somebody mistranslating a verse and saying, well, that's somehow related to crucifixion. That's nonsense. Look at the whole point of the Messiah. The whole point is that he's going to change the world. Nothing's different, is it? Except that a lot of people have been killed in the name of Christianity. So th these verses don't, don't make any sense at all. He couldn't, have, he couldn't have died for our sins because usually if you, are, if you atone, then things get better. For the Jews, things got horribly worse. The, the Roman persecution was kind of like the Holocaust of that day. They didn't have the same technology, but it was a Holocaust. And we've had continued persecution since, and then it's like bookends, we had another one. Now, perhaps Dr. Brown is going to say, well, that's because you rejected the Messiah. That's an odious, odious concept, that the Jews are being punished for using their rational minds. Odious. And it's not true. It's been used by our enemies repeatedly, but it is not true. It is nonsense, and that is not why. And if someone's going to come along and give us some obscure passages, and we're supposed to guess who he is, and then, he's, and then we guess wrong and we're punished for it, then what the heck did he come for? Just stay away then if that's what you're trying to do. Don't play these silly games and cause us to be subjected to torture because we use reason and logic. That's not a nice thing to do. And that's not what he did. He, his words, I say, were misconstrued. The, the Bible that Dr. Brown is focusing in on is a God, it's a God of wrath. If you don't believe it, look at Randall Terry, the uh, supporter of Operation Oppressive, I mean Operation Rescue. He, uh, he said, I want you to just let a wave of intolerance wash over you. I want to let a wave of hatred wash over you. Yes, hate is good. Our goal is a Christian nation. We have a biblical duty. We are called by God to conquer this country. We don't want equal time or we don't want pluralism. I faced that firsthand when I had death threats against me by the pro-life people. And Dr. Brown's books are very similar to that. We've got to fight a revolution. We've got to get militant about this. By the way, Jesus supposedly is a man of peace. 
he might have been, but if not if Dr. Brown is correct. If Dr. Brown is correct and he's really God, then he was out there ordering genocide in Jewish scripture when it said that Joshua didn't rest until they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep, and asked for the edge of the sword. In Deuteronomy, it said God is telling people that they have to wipe out the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. I thought if Jesus is God, he's ordering all that. That's him doing it. And if he's going to come back at the end of times and send back the rest of the people, that's not all that loving. What is this, a facade? He's killing people and destroying people, and then all of a sudden, at the, for a few years, he pretends to be peaceful? It doesn't make any sense. How much time do I have, sir? Uh, about four minutes. Four minutes, good. I got a question I'd like to ask the audience. How many people have kids here? How many, how many of you who, who raise your hands could imagine sending your children to a place of an eternal torment because they didn't worship you sufficiently. How many people, how many people could do that to their children? None. We're supposed to believe that that's what God does. Now, I always thought that God had more love than we do, but what you're telling me is that every person in this audience has more love than God. That does not meet the Jewish definition of God. Let me ask you something else. How many of you could send your children to eternal torment, not for something they did, but for something somebody else did? as we're supposed to be doing with Adam. How many? That would be so unjust. We're supposed to imagine that God has less justice than everybody in this room and everybody on the planet. That makes no sense. That is not a Jewish concept of God. Now, Dr. Brown might tell me, well, that's what it says in the, in the Torah. I'm a reformed Jew. We don't accept the literal view. We don't believe that God did these things. I don't believe he did these things. I don't believe our ancestors did these things. These things never happened. But if they did happen, and if you were to take that literally, you would be worshiping an ogre. The ideas that we see of people who are infatuated with the Bible, who believe in this God who is rather cruel. It's similar to when you find someone who's in love with someone who isn't treating them that well. And you might say, hey, they're beating you. Why, why are you putting up with this? Oh, I deserve it. I'm a wretch. Listen to what you hear from the fundamental. I'm a wretch. I, my ancestors, they deserved it. When all these people were being wiped out, they deserved it. We're wretches. We're all wretches. We all deserve it. We're born horrible. Well, isn't he treating you bad? Well, I know him better than you do. I have him in my heart. I know what he's really like. You don't really know. He treats me well. It's just that I mess up once in a while, and that's why I keep getting these bruises. But he loves me. Don't you dare tell me about him. But, and then they try to tell you, well, why don't, why don't you also hang out with this guy? I think you'd really like him. That's what the fundamentals are trying to do to Jews. Why don't, you, why don't you hang out with this ogre? And then if you say, no, we don't really want to, they get very offended by it. Well, we don't, we don't celebrate or worship somebody like that. So that, that's, that's not really for us. Dr. Brown says that, well, the experts are saying that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of proof about Jesus. There is no such proof. I don't know what experts he's talking about. They're kind of like the same, I, the person he named, I don't know who he is, kind of like the expert who said in uh, the 1890s that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Or, some, or it's probably like Harry Warner who said before movies came out, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Or he's probably like Milliken who said it's impossible to tap the power of the atom. He's probably like the commissioner of baseball who said Ruth made a big mistake when he gave up pitching. The experts you can't always believe. Okay, so these, these so-called experts, I don't, I don't even know who the guy is, but there's not that. He says, well, there's so many Christians around, that must prove that religion works. All that proves is that he had a good salesman in Paul, and he had a vicious, malicious, maniacal killer, Constantine, who killed anyone who got in the way. How, how does that prove that your religion is successful when it's spread by the sword and it's spread by people who are killing people if you disagree? I guess by his standard, Islam must be the true religion. Because I see that all over the place. But I'm not convinced that because there's a lot of people practicing it, that that somehow means that it's valid. Um, the Christian scriptures don't even claim that they were written by God. Christian scriptures say the gospel according to Mark, according to Matthew, according to Luke, according to John. They didn't claim it. Why? Why did the fundamentalists claim it? My, my seven-year-old child asked me, if God wrote Christian scripture, where is a copy of it? What happened to it? You mean God wrote this thing and nobody bothered keeping it? What did they do, lose it? 
Come on, where is it? We don't even, the first document we even have is some fragment from like the 300s. Where, where, where is this special document if, if it's so valuable? They were just letters. Paul's writing a letter and all of a sudden that's the word of God. Thanks for your time. Well, friends, we discovered something. Uh, I believe the Bible, Rabbi Silver, does not. Um, not only that, I thought our subject was who is Jesus, not who is Pat Robertson, who is Randall Terry, who are, who are people that have done violence in Jesus. I, I thought the debate was about who is Jesus, and now you're going to try to use emotional tools to, to play with, with, with people's thinking. I want you to hear the evidence, okay? Now, I want to be fair also. Rabbi Silver, I, I quoted two of the most prestigious biblical scholars in the last two generations that anybody in biblical scholar, scholarship knows. He said, I never heard of him. Unfortunately, this is like me trying to argue civil libertarian law with Rabbi Silver. It's not my field. This is not his field. It's embarrassing to me to have to say it, but I've got to be candid just in case you're moved by any of these things. So here, j just so you hear some of the disingenuousness of just what took place. He starts by thanking Rabbi Tobias Singer and then other prominent atheists, all right, like Richard Dawkins, who mocks, mocks in the ugliest imaginable terms the God of the Hebrew Scriptures. He thanked him. Rabbi Tobias Singer is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Oh, we are opposed in terms of our views in Jesus. But Rabbi Singer will tell you that the moment you leave Orthodox Judaism within four generations, you'll apostatize from Judaism and completely be lost to the Jewish people. There are Orthodox rabbis that don't even recognize Rabbi Silver as a rabbi. So, I mean, let, I, I'm, if you have a problem, I'm just, I'm just putting things where they, where they belong, okay, to be honest here. If you have a problem with the issue of hell, if it's taught in the Hebrew Bible, deal with it. You deal with Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many, this is in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will arise, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. I believe what's written there. Exactly how it works out is God's business, but I know he's good and faithful and just, and I simply trust him. Uh, let, let's go a little bit further here. When, when he says the New Testament, New Testament records are horrible. Oh, do, do we have 5,500 manuscripts of the New Testament, okay? Here, the, the, the Mishnah, for example, which is cherished in Jewish writing, the earliest manuscripts of the Mishnah, about 1,000 years after it takes place. The earliest manuscripts we have of the Hebrew Bible are several hundred years after it takes place. The first manuscripts we have of the New Testament writings, the first fragments, are within 50 years of when the documents were written. It is the best attested book in the ancient world. Here, let me, let me share with you what some recognized scholars have to say. That's why you do your homework. That's why you learn, so that you can speak with some degree of authority. Uh, here, E.M. Blakelock, professor of classics, Auckland University. I claim to be a historian. My approach to classics is historical. And I tell you that the evidence for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. I go on with quote after quote along these lines. This is recognized. In fact, the ones that talk about the Christ myth and we don't know if he ever lived, they're not the historians. They're the theologians who have an axe to grind for the most part. Let me take this a little further. Rabbi Silver tells us we know as much about Jesus as we know about the Wizard of Oz, but then he tells us how Jesus has been misrepresented. How in the world does he know that? He questions whether he ever lived, and then says everybody's representing him. Misrepresenting him, how? Because he's got a Jesus created in his own mind who's a vegetarian environmental activist. Come on. <laughs> I mean, he quotes John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. They all absolutely believed that Jesus was a historical figure. And Thomas Jefferson was a regular church-attending man, and, and, and he was not an atheist. He was a deist on top of it. Uh, 10,000 contradictions in the Bible. You read my books. I didn't know it would be an attack on me or my books. You have the benefit of reading them, okay? I do not come up with an obscure passage here and there and make it fit. I wrestle with things for decades. I dialogue with rabbis to this day on a weekly basis. I have sifted it through and said, God, if I'm wrong, if my beliefs are wrong, if traditional Judaism or something else is right, I'll follow it because I only want to glorify you and honor you and do what's right. I don't care what the consequences are. If you like to do it, you have to do what's right. I've sifted this through and the overwhelming evidence in, in its most clear sense. Here, just sit down and read it. Don't take my word for it. Forget the books. Forget Rabbi Silver. Sit down and read the text for yourself. He wants to quote one or two texts from a book that he doesn't even believe in necessarily. I mean, I'm curious to find out later. Why does he believe in the Hebrew Scriptures? 
What is, he, he, he tells us that what is recorded about Moses and the children of Israel driving out the Canaanites that the book of Genesis tells us was because of their sin, because of their immorality and injustice, is, is what the rest of the scriptures tell us. He says it couldn't be. That would be a horrible God. I mean, he's, he's, I'm offended with him attacking the God of the Torah. <laughs> that's, that's disturbing to me. For <laughs> I mean, I have to admit, I'm a little frustrated just on a scholastic basis. Yeah. You know, Jerome talks about all these perverted books. Yeah, there were other people writing these bogus books that claimed to be the Word of God that were completely bogus, that had nothing to do with the New Testament writings, and he rejected them. What's that got to do with the New Testament writings? I mean, it's, it's so frustrating. A vote was taken on which books belong. You know, you could say the same thing about the Hebrew Scriptures if you want. The, the fact is people receive the books as holy and recognize them as being passed down accurately. And the greatest proof is the life-changing effect that it has. You know, the, the, idea that, the idea that Christianity is growing by the sword. You know how many persecuted Christians there are around the world? You know, you know how many? Over one million Christians have been murdered in Darfur. I've had friends working in, in Sudan for over 20 years. I, I applaud Rabbi Silver for being interested in that. Too. Those are Christians being killed. Where it's growing around the world, it's people being killed. It's people being persecuted. It's people dying rather than denying their faith. One of my friends baptized a man in Pakistan. Both of his arms were chopped off because he converted from Islam to Christianity. And then he was baptized. And no one's coming with a sword to you. I mean, this is disingenuous stuff, and it's frustrating. It needs to be exposed honestly so that we can hear the evidence, look at it carefully. The idea that the only attestation about Jesus is, is uh, forgeries. I mean, I hear volume four of my series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. I quote Roman historian after Roman historian. That, that these are Roman historians that talk about things, that attest his death, that attest his followers, that attest to things that were believed about him. In, in fact, when you read the early uh, literature of the first followers of Jesus, like at the end of the first, early second century especially, they're saying, check it out, because everybody knows what happened. This wasn't done on a corner. And if I get up and say, Barack Obama, who ever heard of Barack Obama? I'm not exposing the other person's ignorance of the subject, I'm exposing mine. Unfortunately, there is historical source after historical source, solid argument that can be made. Even the nature of the New Testament writings give you hints and insights about them being eyewitness accounts. And again, you do scholarly, literary uh, criticism, textual criticism. When, when you have recorded things that are embarrassing about your earliest followers and leaders, that's another mark of authenticity. The Hebrew Scriptures do that. The New Testament writings do that as well. You know, the idea that Paul invented Christianity, I, I figured at some point that that argument would come up. The fact is, the beliefs were firmly established at the time that he himself became a believer in Jesus, Yeshua. You have many, many other streams attesting to these same beliefs from other authors. And, in point of fact, when it was quoted that he became all things to all people, 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 20 to 22, you know what he's talking about? Cultural sensitivity. When you're with certain people with certain customs, if you can abide by those customs, you know, you travel overseas, don't do certain things that offend, that's what you do. But the idea that he would use deceit and lying to get the messages, I might as well say Rabbi Silver's lying. Or I, I, it's, it's just bogus, false accusations. And you know, there's a, there's a well-known legal saying, when your case is weak, speak louder, <laughs> you know, shout louder. And, and you know, we don't have evidence, just try to make everybody else look bad. I hope you'll really go through this, get the DVD when it comes out, and go through the evidence that's been presented carefully. I will defy anyone to sit down with me with a Hebrew Bible in Hebrew and look at the overall testimony and prove that the overall testimony does not indicate that Jesus had to be the Messiah of Israel and therefore the Savior of the world. Oh, the, oh boy, I mean, it's just... Uh, let me ask you this. If you read the Torah, it says there are blessings for obedience and their curses for disobedience, doesn't it? And if you've ever read Leviticus, the 26th chapter, and Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, it says that there's punishment for disobedience. I didn't put that in there. Whether the punishment is everlasting, whether the punishment is death in this world, whether the punishment is somewhere in between, I'll leave that to God. I'm not even discussing that right now because that's not the topic of our discussion. If we want to have a discussion about eternal punishment one day, I'm happy to look at what the scriptures say, happy to look at what Jewish traditions say, what the New Covenant writings say, but I'm jealous to keep on our point as much as possible. If you have a problem with the idea of punishment sometimes being right, then you have a problem with the God of the Bible. 
He's not vindictive. He's not mean spirit, but he's just. And look, here's some rapist that that you know this this guy that that captured uh, uh, the young lady out in California, held her for 18 years. He's sentenced to 50 years in jail for previous rape. Gets out after 10. Some would say there was no justice there. If he had, if he had kept his sentence, if it was a right sentence, if he had been in jail, he wouldn't have had this act on someone else. The idea that punishment is always wrong is is wrong spirit. So we need to understand a few fundamental things. All of us do fall short. I never saw my time warnings there. I missed it. Okay. I'll come back later. Thank you. Well, let's look at how objective Dr. Brown is. He says that the Christian scripture is the reason why slavery was abolished. I noticed that where the Bible Belt was, that's where the stronghold was. Now you tell me, is he being objective? Um, 1 Peter 2.18 Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good gentle, but also to the unreasonable. Titus 2.9.10 Bid slaves to be submissive and give satisfaction in all respects. 1 Timothy 6.1 Let all who are under the yoke of slavery regarding their masters so that, uh, so that, so that the name of God Will, be, will not be defamed. Obey your masters so they won't be defamed. Is that objective? To say that the New Testament and not even notice that? Why doesn't he tell you that? Is he trying to be objective or is he trying to sell a product? If you're going to speak about what Jesus said in Christian scripture, then do it. And do it honestly and do it objectively. Don't just sell me something. Um, you know, Jesus is portrayed as being God. And Jesus didn't believe he's God. Let me explain that to you. If any one of these verses existed in the Bible, we could, or in Christian scripture, we could say, Dayenu. That would be enough to believe that he wasn't God. Matthew 19, 17. A man fell on his knees and said to Jesus, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why callest me thou good? There's no, none good but one. That is God. That's Jesus talking. That's all you need to say that Jesus didn't believe he's God. That's it. John 5, 30. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. Dayenu. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Dayenu. My father is greater than I. Dayenu. At this point, a rational person would say, well, I guess he's not God. John 7, 16. My doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Who's he praying to? Jesus kneeled down and prayed. Luke 22, 41. If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. How could he be praying and asking someone to do something? That's him. But of that day and that hour, no one knows, not the Son, neither the Son, but only the Father. For there is one God, Timothy, between God and men, and the man, Jesus Christ. I mean, if you're being objective, you would realize that this can't possibly be God. Genesis 6.3, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for his flesh. 1 Kings 8.27, 2 Chronicles, can God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Heaven itself, the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Common sense, how could, a, how could somebody younger be co-eternal with somebody who's the father? How, how does that work? The, now, Dr. Brad says, well, there's historians who, who believe in, in uh, Jesus, and these historians prove my point. I heard a very loud pregnant silence. I heard myself attacked because of my lack of knowledge, but I, I don't want to get into quoting different historians to prove a point. Anybody who's a Christian can get a degree calling themselves an historian and say, oh yeah, there's plenty of proof for that. I want to know where is the proof? Not somebody you're talking about. Tell me the proof that you have. Who are the eyewitnesses you're talking about, sir? Happy to tell you. Great. Tell, name them. Tell me who were the translators that translated from whatever language it was written in to whoever happened to write it. Tell me that. Tell me, how did Paul know which books, or how did Constantine and the councils of Hippo and Carthage in 397, how did they, you say it was inspired. Who inspired these people? Who were these people? Who were the people that are telling you that this is God's word? And how do you have blind faith in those people? Who were they? Now Jesus clearly didn't believe he was God, but Paul did. And Paul wanted to be all things to all people. And therefore he decided to make Jesus into a, a pagan. Now I'm going to read something to you. Tell me if it sounds familiar. He, will, he who will not eat of my body and drink of my blood, so that he will be made one with me and I with him, the same shall not know salvation. That's part of the Mithra cult, my friends. 
That's where we get all this stuff about Jesus. We get it from the Mithra cult. We get it from other pagan stories. Let me tell you about the pagan stories circulating around the Middle East at the time of these stories dealt with Hercules, Osiris, Bacchus, Mithra, Hermes, Prometheus, Perseus, and Horus. You ever realize where the word Easter comes from? As Dr. Brown, he'll tell you. It comes from, uh, it's related to Astarte. It's related to the word star. It means that they were, they, pagan, they took a pagan holiday and made it into uh, their own holiday. Now the, the Mithra cult and these god men all said that their, their gods were equal or the son of God. They said they were born of a virgin. After their death, they ascended. They said they were born in a cave somewhere around December 25. They said they were visited by magi. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were baptized. They hung out with 12 people. They were portrayed as a quiet man. They turned water into wine at a marriage ceremony. They healed the sick. They did miracles. They were accused and persecuted. And uh, they rode in on a donkey. They were accused of heresy. They were betrayed for, for money. They were, they were equated with bread and wine. Mithri had to eat his body and drink his blood, just like with Jesus. I, I could go on and on. The whole, the whole thing is, that, is paganism that, that Paul adopted. Now, Dr. Brown says Jesus was a paragon of virtue. He probably was. Why do I think he was a liberal? Because he was a Pharisaic rabbi. And the Pharisaic rabbis were extremely liberal. They were the reformers. But the people who, con who made Christianity, who concocted it, like Constantine, he was a brutal barbarian. So I believe that he made Jesus in his image, and you can piece together things that are inconsistent. Like he says, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword, but he's also talking about peace. Why was that? Because there were certain fragments around, and he couldn't change everything totally. Dr. Brown says, what, 5,000 documents, it must be real. I guess... Chairman Mao's book must be real. I think there were about a billion of those documents. The fact there's a lot of documents is worse, because how do you know which one's real? It's like playing telephone. These people are writing documents all over the place, and all he has is a fragment. Don't quote your historians. Tell me, what, when was the first time that the New Testament actually showed up in real form that you have? Oh, here, here's the book. It wasn't until very, very late, you know. Now, what did Jesus have to say about different topics? Tell me if this sounds like God. Wives, submit yourself to the husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Titus 2, 3. And in the congregation of the saints, maybe fine silver couldn't have come up here if we were actually be taking seriously the words of Jesus. Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, must remain in submission, as the Lord says. If they inquire, want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands. For it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Jesus referred to non-Jews as dogs and swine, according to Matthew 15, 21, 9, and he said he doesn't want to cast pearls to the swine. I read Michael Brown's explanation of how we can call non-Jews dogs. His explanation, well, he really meant a house dog, if you read the translation, so it's not really all that bad. <laughs> so, uh, and it's amazing the lengths that some people go to in order to try to justify this. If you were rational, you would just look at it and say, this guy's not God. Wealthy people won't go into heaven. He calls Simon Peter Satan. If he calls Simon Peter Satan and put him head, as head of the church, then what kind of church is this? It says that everyone must be well armed. Everyone who doesn't own a sword is to go out and buy one. You've got to hate everybody. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life, he can't be my disciple. I've come to set a man warring against his father. A guy said he wanted to bury his father. He said, forget your father and come with me. Now, I'm sure Dr. Brown has an explanation for it, but is it rational? Is it reasonable? If you're looking at this objectively, wouldn't you just say, you know, maybe all these torturous explanations don't make sense. Maybe there's a, it's called Occam's razor. Look for the easiest explanation. What's the easiest explanation? That all of these things occurred in there, and he's still God, or just that he's not God? And that the Bible is inaccurate and misrepresented him. He says, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And then he's telling everybody to hate your brother. How could that be? How could he tell you to hate your brother and then say if you're angry at your brother, you're going to be in judgment? How is that? The, the people who believe in this, I ask you, use your rational mind. Jesus was taught, taught people to disrespect the, their family and their friends. He said he came not to change a jot or tittle of the old law, and everything is completely changed beyond recognition. And the Jewish scripture says you're not allowed to add or subtract anything. If all these, all these commandments can be ignored, but Dr. Brown doesn't want to ignore the part about the, the violent part. 
those, those parts he likes, the, the need for blood, the sacrifice. He, he asks, how could, how, how could there all be all this blood upon us, the, the bloody tradition of the church, how could that be? He doesn't know. He's like asking a question, how could this be? Well, ask uh, Bishop Spahn. A ask, ask Christians who have made a serious attempt to figure it out, and they'll tell you. It's very easy. Just look at the scriptures, and you'll find it right there. There's a lot of contradictions on the, in the Bible, in the Christian Bible. Now, if, if this is God's word, how could God not get the words on the cross right? How does he get that mixed up? Matthew, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. Mark, king of the Jews. Luke, this is the king of the Jews. John, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. It's close, but close isn't good enough if you're God. And if it's written on the cross, it had to be up there for a little while. Matthew says he was killed at Golgotha. Luke says it was cavalry. Luke says one of the thieves reviled Jesus and the other one rebuked him. Mark says it was both thieves. All right. You know, I, I propose a future debate. Is the Hebrew Bible God's word? I'll say yes, and Rabbi Silver can say no. Yeah, absolutely. There you heard it. Again, as I said, that's our fundamental difference. Okay. Um, all right. So, so let's uh, let's do this. I think we go two minutes back and forth. So you'll hit the bell, right? So I, I want to begin by by responding to a couple of comments of Rabbi Silver. Let me do this just so I can look in your direction. Um, when uh, when you talk about Jesus being God. Again, you completely skip over thousands of pages of, of what I've written about it, or thousands of words. The fact is, God, this complex unity, reveals himself to us through his son, Jesus. It is something I can demonstrate to you from the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. But let, let's go back to this. You say, how do we know this is God's word? Okay, by the same criteria, and I'll, I'll, give, you the, I'll give you the manuscript evidence, I'll give you the dates, I'll give you the Roman historians, I'll give you all. You, what Rabbi sort of forgets is there's... there's 200 plus years, almost 300 years of evidence before Constantine ever comes on the scene with writings of followers of Jesus that teach the same message. All Constantine did was made the thing the official Roman religion. Well, he didn't create something out of, out of nothing, okay? It's like looking at American history starting today instead of looking at the documents. So, so we have all the writings of the early church leaders. We have the apologists. We have, and the manuscript evidence out of, out of, out of 5,500 plus manuscripts, okay, there's about 1% question about textual variants, none of which have to do with anything of any substance. The first fragments are found within 50 years of the writings of the first document. The first full complete copies within 250 years. If you want to compare that to other literature like Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, or, or famous histories, most of those you have two or three documents, not 5,000, and they're about 1,000 years after the fact. So Rabbi Silver, on what basis do you follow the Hebrew Scriptures? On what basis do you think they're inspired? You know, the manuscript evidence is massively in favor of the New Testament documents. If you look at Mishnah and Talmud, massively in favor in terms of attestation. Uh, you know, you talk about people getting things right. God can get it right. Well, people have pointed out contradictions between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. There's contradictions in the Ten Commandments. What makes you think the Hebrew Scriptures are God's Word? I just, and you're proving my point, sir. When you say there's contradictions in Jewish scripture, you're not solving your problem, you're compounding it. Because you're basing your whole religion on the accuracy of God's word. How do you just casually dismiss these contradictions? You're like two kids in a sandbox. Ah, oh, my Bible's better than your Bible, you got contradictions. Sir, those contradictions in Jewish scripture, they go to the heart of your case. And yes, I do believe that the Jewish people did their best to bring God understanding of God, understanding of humanity, of decency to the world. That's what they did. It's like the scientific process. There were some incredible scientists that lived in Greek times. These people were amazing, and they moved us forward. But some of them thought the world was in the center of the universe. In science, if something's wrong, you challenge it and you learn. In religion, if something's wrong, you just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Reform Judaism believes that human beings have the right to evolve and that we can grow in our appreciation, and we don't believe that God is so sadistic and so anthropomorphic that he gets a kick out of smelling charred animal flesh. <coughs> this is not the type of God of any type of sophistication. You tell me that there was a document 250 years later, that's the first one? Well, I asked you, who were the eyewitnesses? And, and I want to know who they were and who wrote the Gospels. We don't even know. What was Mark's last name? Whoa, who is he? Mark who? 
And, and, where, and where, where, where do these people live? Where do they get this information from? You say there was no contradictions, that all the Bibles were the same. Why did St. Jerome say, not perversions, but perversions? Think about it. He was closer to the time than you were, sir. He said, not perversions. You ever hear of the Gnostics? They had all types of Gospels that were just thrown out, and if you've ever tried to read one of them or circulate, you'd be killed. That's how they got uniformity. The same way that they got in the Inquisition. They said all these other books are out the window. They were Jewish followers of Jesus, my friends. And these followers wanted to preserve Judaism. Constantine okay. didn't. And that's why he got rid of all those books, and, that, and that's why he said uh, all right. So, So we go from mythology to history again, okay? You can stay with the mythology, I'll get back with the history. All right, and, and, and listen, I know you come in, some of you are 100% on my side, some of you 100% on Rabbi Silver's side, but I'm really urging you to study this out, to look at the evidence, okay? So, eyewitness accounts. I suggest you read the book by Richard Bowden, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, just won a prize for, for literature in the UK last year, or a year before that. Uh, Balcom demonstrates in great detail that we can be quite sure that John was the author of the gospel attested to him, and he was an eyewitness to John Silver. He was a vegetarian environmental activist. Okay? And it boggles my mind that still Rabbi Silver tells me we know less about Jesus than the Wizard of Oz all knows he's a Pharisaic rabbi somehow. You've created him in your own image is what you've done. But let, let me... Well, let me go, okay? We can both be feisty, that's the fun of this year, all right? Two Jews, you know, sparks are going to fly. But I trust there will be more light than heat, okay? So, people did not go by last names. They were so-and-so son of so-and-so, okay? We have that evidence about John. That's the first, I mean, the ancient world, we know that. Okay, so, uh, you know that, too. I mean, you're, you're having fun with that point. But let's just get back to this. John, an eyewitness... We have attestation that, that Peter was an eyewitness, and he gave the information to Mark. Mark was known as the translator. There's also excellent evidence that Matthew was an eyewitness. We have more eyewitness attestation of the life of Jesus than any other ancient figure. Pray tell, can you tell me eyewitnesses of Rabbi Hillel? Pray tell, can you tell me manuscript evidence of the Mishnah? Please tell me the earliest manuscript of the mission. You must, you must esteem that as, as sacred on some level. It's completed around the year 200 of this era, 200 CE. What's the earliest manuscript evidence of the mission? To, let, let's look at Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Tell me other ancient historians that talked about it. Please answer that, the mission, the estetation. I have no idea of the historical accuracy of the Mishnah, and my religion doesn't rise or fall on it. Yours, yours does. You're the one coming and you're saying, Gee, you're making an extraordinary claim. Jesus came down from earth. The Bible the word of God. You're making an extraordinary claim, and I want extraordinary proof. And I see an extraordinary lack of proof. Who translated from Peter and John into Greek? John wrote in Greek, and, okay. and Mark was Peter's translator. How do you know that? We have, we have the accounts that tell us that. Uh, from 250 years later. How do you know Constantine didn't just say, oh yeah, Peter was an eyewitness. Sure, he's an eyewitness, whatever you say. There's no evidence of any of that. You can't, you can't prove that Constantine, when he picked out books, didn't put different words into it. You don't know that. You don't, and you need an eyewitness for a lot of stuff. Who was the eyewitness when Mary and Elizabeth were, were talking about their new kid? Who was, the, who was the eyewitness for that? Who was the eyewitness when Herod and, and, and was doing all of his machinations? Who was the eyewitness when the, when the people came around the sudden birth? And if Jesus' birth was so miraculous, why is it that all these people come and then they forget about him for 30 years? Doesn't that lead you to believe that that birth is a copy of a myth? It follows every, how do you explain that? How do you explain that everything in the life of Jesus is a parallel to a myth? December 25th, Easter, 12 disciples, eating by blood and body. How do you explain that, sir? Would you like me to jump in now? Yeah, First, most of those things were kind of internet myths you put together. Find good no, scholarly, these are not internet myths, find sir. good scholarly books. There's a whole that lot of Listen, scholars will tell you there is no ancient parallel that is a real parallel to the virgin birth of Jesus. You ever hear a myth for no, no parallel to the virgin birth There is no true ancient parallel to the virgin birth of yeah, Jesus. You don't know what okay. you're talking about, sir. I, there I, were a lot I, of... Excuse all, me, excuse me. I do know what I'm talking about. No, okay, you know, sir. fine. There were all types, all of those pagan gods were virgin, virginal births with a god, a god and a virgin. You don't, you've yes. never heard of that? Check the sources. Check, check the information. Okay. You've never okay. heard of that? I've heard of things that are great exaggerations that don't come anywhere close to the point. But to, by the way, about the mission, no, the no, earliest no, manuscripts of the mission are thousands. You've never heard. Oh, of course, the idea. Of course, okay, of course. Of course, I've heard. heard, and the myths are refuted. Volume four, answering Jewish objections the to Jesus. I cite the sources. Okay, 
I cite the sources. I mean, it's a little frustrating when you do your homework, you, you break your teeth to come up with sources and answer these things. But question for you, Rabbi Silver, is, is this. Uh, you speak of the human race evolving as you're hoping there, as a reformed Jew. The 20th century was the bloodiest century in human history. A and you as a Jew cast off all of the historical counts. I mean, the, the exodus from Egypt, the Passover, you have no clue if they ever happened. I have no clue what it means to you to be a Jew, to be a worshiper of God. And the human race you're talking about, I've got more hope in God than I have in the human race to be candid with. So please... How is, the human race, how is the human race evolving? The human race that had a holocaust, the human race with a Mao Zedong butchering 60 million people, the human race with hundreds of thousands of sex offenders in America. How are we evolving? And what does it mean to you to be a Jew? I, I mean, you throw out the Hebrew scriptures, the rabbinic traditions don't have to be real. It, it seems to be the creation of, of your own thinking, your own mind. I, I'm being candid, asking honestly. I appreciate that honesty. It's rather ironic coming from someone who say, "How does it? How do you? How can you claim to be a Jew when you claim to be a Jew and you reject the Shema? Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you're saying the Lord is three. How can you? Let me answer. Let me answer. Let me answer. You need to say that I'm a reformed Jew and I change things. I, reformed Judaism evolved so that a, the religion became modified and more compassionate. You, sir, didn't just do a modification, you did an annihilation. You took God from one and made him into three. You took original goodness and made it into original badness. You took a, a loving God and turned him into a God of hate. You, you took Judaism and turned it on its head. You took a, a hope that we were going to live in peace with people, and you posit a God who's going to toss 90% of humanity into the lakes of fire because of what they believe. That is so un-Jewish. And how can you ask me about Judaism? And the, and the only reason, and the reason, sir, why we haven't advanced so much is because people who have this irrational belief in books that were written thousands of years ago that tell us to kill each other and are, okay, these so people Stalin, are practicing the Stalin's, intolerance of the God that they worship. Stalin's with. murder of human beings has to do with Christian books. Not so. Mao Zedong's murder of human beings has to do with belief in Christian books. Please, not don't all of it, that. sir, but a okay. lot of it. Number one, it's I believe in one God before. and one God only. It's almost the only it's complex in the Jews. I believe in the Shema wholeheartedly. In fact, you don't even know if the Shema ever existed. You don't even know who made it up. You don't know where it came from. I mean, people are clapping when, when, when the words of God are being mocked. Some Jews are clapping when your own Torah is being mocked. I don't get it. You, you've got to reject the God of the Torah. If you want to call him a God of hate, Okay? The, the, the God of the Hebrew Scriptures is the God who expresses vengeance. The God of the Hebrew Scriptures is the one who said he would punish us Jewish people with curses for disobedience. If you want to throw that out, that's your, that's your prerogative. That's between you and God, not between you and me. But, but don't make it like I'm creating some new thing. And enough with this Constantine stuff. We have scores and scores and scores and scores of books by other followers of Jesus that all predate Constantine and that all hold to these same fundamental truths of the death and resurrection of the Messiah and the fundamental teachings about him. I mean, the more you press the Constantine button, the more I hear you say, I don't have an answer, I don't have an answer, I don't have an answer, so I'll throw it on Constantine. So, uh, I have a question for you. Did, did, did the Passover happen? Who picked the books? Who picked the books? How did they determine it? The same as the Hebrew books? scriptures. They were recognized by the people over a period of time because they were passed down and recognized as authoritative. How? Just like the How? Just, by what criteria? Just exact same criteria that was used by the rabbis for the Hebrew exactly. scriptures. And both of them are not the word of God. How? Don't, don't pass the buck, sir. I'm not Please. passing the buck. I'm answering the answer. Thank you. I want an answer to this question. I'll give you an answer. I'll give that people who supposedly believe in judge not lest ye be judged, condemn not lest ye be condemned, run, jump up and down and say, atheist, atheist! That's not very well, Rabbi Silver, in, in all respect, and I, I think it's a little jarring. For you. I, I think it's, I think it's you, jarring, sir. though, for Jewish people and Christian people to hear a rabbi say that the Bible is not the word of God. So just well, show up the Reform Temple. There's, Judaism has evolved a lot in the last 2,000 years. And you, you think might it's want to check it out, so, so the things... Dr. Dr. Brown, I have a, can I ask you a question, or is it just attack Barry? Okay, I got a question for you. In, two, in 250, yes. they had Gnostic Bibles. They had people who wrote... 
from the time of Jesus who were actually Jewish followers. I'm sure you're aware of this. They believed that Judaism should be retained. They said we should keep all of the commandments. They didn't think that we should move the Sabbath, which is an eternal covenant from Saturday to Sunday. How, how is it in 250? How, how did these people know? With all these different books, all these different claims, some saying God, Jesus is God, some saying he isn't, some saying we should adopt the commandments, some saying not. How in 250 did they determine, by what criteria did they determine, and who was they? Who were these people that determined it, and by what criteria did they determine, that's God's word, that's on the cutting room floor. That's God's word, if you follow that one, I'm going to kill you. How did they determine See, that? I don't understand the reference to 250, though. You said that the first book was put together at 250 or so. Oh, okay. I thought the Constantine, of course, exactly. is the next no, section. No, I'm beyond Constantine. 250, right? No, no. We have, we have, we have all kinds of attestation of, of, of quotes from before that. But a oh, very sorry. simple answer for you. Go okay. ahead. Uh, n number one, uh, the New Testament never said that, that Sunday was changed, uh, the Sabbath was changed right. to Sunday. Right. And there are plenty of people here that worship on the seventh day. If Gentiles want to worship on Sunday, that's their prerogative. But Sabbath remains Saturday. That, ha that hasn't changed. And, and, um, I, started, I started by saying who Jesus was not. He wasn't the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ, and he wasn't the founder of a Gentile Sunday morning paced religion. I started my, my talk by, by saying that. There are plenty of things the church has done that's wrong. Our question is, who is Jesus? Okay. My question is, if you so, still remember it, how did they, they, exactly. how did they pick I, I'm, the Bible? I'm about to explain. Go ahead, explain it. The very same way that the Hebrew Scriptures came down, okay. there, there was divine revelation. In other words, God spoke and acted through Moses. Then Moses wrote certain things. Those were re recognized as authoritative. Then there were other people, prophets and others. We're talking about the Hebrew Scriptures first, who spoke. They bore witness to what Moses had said. The community recognized that these were true. Other writings came and went with the Hebrew scriptures, uh, with the, their other writings of Jews, many, many writings of Jews that I don't want to give another two minutes because I don't want them to run out the clock. I still want to answer Yeah, so, okay, so when we get to the New Testament, we have the exact same thing. Many years later, other bogus writings like the Gnostic Gospels and things started to circulate, but people recognized they were like historians understand this, textual critics understand this. These were written much later. So those things that were handed down by eyewitnesses, the, the apostles, which is the Shlichim, the emissaries, those things that were handed down by colleagues of the emissaries that first saw Jesus die and rose from the dead, and rise from the dead, those things were recognized as authoritative. That's why the earliest debates we have, they agree on almost every single book. That they all agreed on Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, for example, as being inspired. There were, there were a couple of debates just like Shir HaShirim, Song of Songs, in the Tanakh. There were debates among the rabbis, is that holy or not? They said it's the holiest of all. So there were debates about some peripheral books, but there was full agreement if you look at the various canons, the various discussions, well before the time of Constantine, and we, and we have the earliest leaders, the disciples of the disciples, okay? The disciples of the eyewitnesses quoting their words. So you could trace it back one or two generations. No way for an answer. How, you, by, you one, the answer. by what criteria did they determine which books were God's word and which weren't? The eyewitnesses of Jesus, his emissaries, and the colleagues of the eyewitnesses passed these things down. They were known well to the people in the community. They were received. They There's were no dead. debate in the earliest days they were long about what dead. was. And the, and the Gnostic Gospels were circulating for a very long time. There's old as What's the earliest Gnostic Gospel? As, as early as, as say, uh, Matthew or Mark? They got writings from the same time period. No, you sir. Know. False. Tell me. False. Factually okay. false. Okay, then why, sir, did St. Jerome said not versions but perversions? Because Obviously, everybody recognized they were perversions. Because right. they were how did they recognize things? which ones were the perversions? Because they had long accepted what the real books were. That's how they knew it. For a couple hundred, three hundred years, they had already accepted what the right books were, and everybody knew it. That's, That's why you can write about it. That's why when you go and you quote, they're, they're the guys called the they Church were. Fathers in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries. You read what they say. They never quote the Gnostic Gospels as authoritative, but they quote what we have and call the New Testament. They, they, listen, there's a science to this. People have studied it. It's easily understood. There, there's not really a mystery to it. You may say they weren't really Final eyewitnesses. Final two minutes. Final two minutes. Okay. But uh, my question for you, did the Passover no, really happen? I have no idea. Okay. Now, let, now let, me ask, let, me, let me try to explain your question. Right? Yeah. Just, just for the people who are still listening. There were a huge amount of Gospels floating around at the time of early Christianity. They were, they were attacking Judaizers who tried to preserve the Jewish teachings of Jesus. They were attacking those teachings that retained Jewish values. There was a very corrupt regime 
that made a determination of which Gospels were authentic, and there was absolutely no basis to do it. And Paul said that he was all things to all people, and therefore he took the Gospels and he made it into a paganized religion. So a pagan emperor accepted these documents, and that's what he used in order to put forward Christianity. You have to have faith not just in Jesus, but in those people, whoever they were, that they got it right. As far as the Passover goes, sir, Judaism is a religion based on freedom and liberation. So we believe in the reform movement that Jews have always fought on the side of freedom. Jews, we believe that historically there's a basis to believe that there was an exodus of people from Jewish people, from Egypt, into what we call the promised land, that there was a basis to believe that, but we believe a lot of the accounts of it are not accurate. And fortunately, the, uh, for all of the people here who say, oh, that's terrible, then all the people here are telling me that they have no problem with God committing genocide against people because they got in the way. And if that's your belief, and if that's your belief, sir, that God is ordering people to commit genocide, then in a world where people are killing each other over mythology, you are part of the problem. Because for a long time, people have looked at those verses and said, oh, God wants us to kill people who get in our way. Jesus is God. Therefore, my God wants me to kill people. And as we said, the debate is one person believes the Bible, the other person doesn't. And that's really what it comes down to. At this time, we're going to take a brief pause, and I would encourage any of you who have uh, questions, if you could make your way to the front. Uh, there's a microphone to my left and a microphone to my right. Dr. Brown, um, you mentioned Daniel as well, um, which talked about uh, the concept of condemnation of people, and, um, and then some are going to be saints forever. Um, as a Christian, I, I, I've wondered this. Um, in the, in the uh, Torah or Old Testament, as Christians say, you see the concept of Sheol, hell, uh, where a pit is really described as a pit. But in, in 300 years before Jesus was born, when they say Daniel was written, you see the concept of eternal damnation and eternal life. Um, for the first time in terms of a condemnation, and, and, and perhaps there's a concept of torture there. I'm wondering, um, as a Christian, it's just it's the question, why, why is this if, if um, eternal damnation is such an important uh, question um, and concept for, for an individual, why does this appear 300 years before Jesus, and, um, and especially with Jesus? I mean, he talks about it a lot. I'm just so wondering, the, so the, okay. why this wasn't it beforehand? Okay. Yeah, very, very simple uh, answer is that God reveals truth progressively through the scriptures. One thing builds on another through the scriptures. You read things in the Torah, you build on that in the prophets, you build on that in the rest of the literature. So that's to be fully expected. I would debate that Daniel was written in, in the third century, by the way, and I would debate that that's, uh, that's the same time that you have, quote, the concept of eternal damnation come up. But this, this much is clear. You, people can debate exactly what is meant by eternal damnation or eternal punishment. Or, there, there are all kinds of different concepts people have. This much we know is very important. Are we right with God or not? Are our sins forgiven or not? God is just. There are plenty of people that do all kinds of wicked things in this world and never seem to pay for them. Where is the justice? We would say there is justice yet in the world to come. Judaism, traditional Judaism would say there, there's the worst, there's 11 months of punishment, you know, and, and then uh, then eternal life, just to, to oversimplify the fact. The, so Jesus, basically, when he was teaching, by the way, was in, in accordance with Pharisaic Judaism of its day, which did actually teach about eternal punishment. So Jesus, as a Jew of his day, was speaking to his people and did warn us that we needed to be right with God. In his incredible mercy, rather than condemning us, he's, it's the scriptures say he didn't come to condemn but to save, he lays down his life for us so that we can be forgiven. Next question. Oh, yeah. This concept about hell is not Jewish. There's some reference to afterlife, but there's no reference about eternal damnation. That's something they picked up from these pagan cultures. It's not a Jewish concept. We couldn't imagine a God so horrible. But uh, Dr. Brown does. He writes that as Christians, we believe that everyone who rejects our message will be sentenced to eternal punishment by God. That's extreme. We also believe that everyone who does not know the Lord is a child of Satan. 
That's a lot of people. I think, according to his calculation, this is about 90% of the people. Because he also wrote a book, How Saved Are We?, saying that even the fundamentalist Christians, most of them aren't really saved, they just think so. There's a whole bunch of children of Satan out there, and they're all going to hell. All right. Next question for Rabbi Silver, please. Okay. We need to alternate. Uh, this question is for uh, Rabbi Silver. Sure. If you, don't, you do not believe in the uh, Hebrew Bible or the Torah, what does your faith is based upon? Is there any validity? Is there any God that you're basing your ideas from? If none of that what you believe is true, it is all relevant. Is there or is there no God? You follow, you don't follow, or it is just well, my, my, an idea of your imagination? Yeah, my, my, uh, my approach is a lot easier than yours. So you gotta choose or pick which one is this, which of all these books the teachings about Zeus or Apollo or Mithra or the Koran or the Bhagavad Gita or astrology. Which of these are the real ones? How do you figure that one out? Well, I guess you got to just get an inclination. If you happen to live in the United States, chances are you'll probably pick the uh, Christian scripture. What a coincidence. And if you happen to live in a Muslim country, you'll happen to pick the Koran. What a coincidence. And by what criteria do you do that? Well, a million people, a billion people believe it. Everybody else believes it. Must be true. I prefer to use something called reason. No. Newton, no, reason doesn't exclude God, sir. Newton, Newton said, I can't imagine that the God that created me with this mind would abjure me to disregard its use. You're not answering his question. Amen. What is the question? I thought I did. Whether you do believe in God or not, if you do, then there's got to be some basis to base it upon the Hebrew Bible, which you have refused to believe it upon. The Bible reflects our people's efforts to understand ourselves, the universe, and how it all got there. It's an evolving understanding which I embrace. And I believe that the Bible reflects some incredibly beautiful sentiments about where we can go and where we're heading, but it does not, sir, reflect God's word unless you consider God to be a sadist, which I do not. I happen to share, if I can just take it, I happen to share Einstein's view and Newton's view about God, that the incredible symmetry, the beauty, the wonder that we see in this life and this planet, in this world, gives us a sense of awe and appreciation of the majesty behind that power that created it. But I do not, sir, believe that God is sending you or me. That's the gospels, the good news. That hell is a figment of everybody's imagination to keep people scared. Yeah, so again, the only one trying to scare you is Rabbi Silver by constantly coming up with all this hell talk and trying to make me look like the bogeyman, by the way. But in point, in, point, in point of fact, it's an, absolute, it's an absolute tragedy, an absolute tragedy that a teacher of the Jewish people does not believe in the Hebrew scriptures and is so uncertain about God. You can, claim, you can think I've gone heretical, okay? You can think I've gone heretical, but I do not stand in judgment about God. I don't stand here with my puny little human brain and say, I claim the God of the Bible is a sadist. Who in the world gives human beings the right to pass judgment on God? And, and the very same human beings that Rabbi Silver is pointing to is reasonable, something he's unreasonable. We, all have we right bow to. down before the one true God and shut our mouths. Rabbi Silver, several times you, uh, you uttered the words, show me proof. How do you know this is true? And for a while, you sounded to me like the president of Iran who denies the Holocaust. There is no proof. It's all contrived. The pictures don't mean anything. They're Photoshopped. That's not what my question was about. Yeah, that is just a cheap shot that has nothing to do with what I've been talking about. So don't compare me to somebody who's denying the Holocaust because there's absolutely no connection. You're denying uh, something which has been attested to, but that's not really what the question attested is. Attested to by whom? Who translated and who chose the again, books? We answered those already. You, sir, uh, as a rabbi, believe in God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I presume. Uh, but you don't, as you have mentioned, you don't believe in the Torah, you don't believe that the Old Testament is the inspired word of God. How, sir, do you then know right from wrong? How do you know how to please your creator? Does he whisper in your ear or in, 
or is it something that just you believe what suits you? And how then does that differ from someone else who believes differently from you? Okay, allow him to answer. Go ahead, Rabbi. I, I use reason, logic, and liberal thinking. I would ask the same question to you, sir. If you believe in a God who commits genocide, how do you, sir, determine whether you should do it or not yourself? If you believe in a God who, as Jesus said, women, submit yourselves and don't speak in public, how do you know, sir, how do you decide that those words you're not going to follow? If Jesus is calling non-Jews dogs and swine, how do you, sir, decide that you're not going to follow that anymore? If Jesus is saying that everybody doesn't believe like he does is going to hell, how do you, sir, decide that that's not a very good thing? If Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you have to hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother, how do you, sir, decide that you're going to ignore that particular one? And if Jewish scripture says that God's one, how do you, sir, deny that and say he's three? The, the how do you do that? The answer is, again, again, Rabbi Silver has no concept of God's complex unity that we're speaking of, otherwise he wouldn't keep speaking of like three gods, but that's okay. Um, it's very easy to determine what's meant by reading parallel passages, by reading the whole context. That's where you have to read things in context. So we know what Jesus meant and the honor he required for mother and father. Hate father and mother means utterly reject everyone that has a claim on your life beyond God, which comes straight from Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter. He was paraphrasing Torah there. So it's very easy. You look at all these things, and, and here's something. Listen, to me, a baby in the womb is sacred. In your mind, you should defend a woman's right to, to end the pregnancy at any point. To me, no, here's the, here's the point. By our reason, just listen. By our reason, you see we have a difference. By our reason. So we need to go back and analyze what Scripture says. At this time, due to our just time constraint, the point, we our, have a difference based on reason. In our 30-minute time limit for the question and answer, what we want to do is have the final question directed toward Rabbi Silver, and then we need to move on to the closing say? statement. I'm, I'm willing to stick around. Okay. Rabbi, right, but I'm we need to be considerate for the time. So. Hey, I'm, I'm, stay. Hello, I'm, stay. Stay. I'm a Jew, and I've got to say, my brother's a rabbi. I've never heard of a rabbi that doesn't believe in the Torah. All right. Here's my question. Here's my question. I have a comment and question. You should read in Hebrew Genesis 126 as an answer to the last gentleman's question about the triunity of God. In Genesis 126, let God said, let us create man in our image. In Hebrew, that's translated, as you know, God in the plural. But my question is this. As a rabbi and a reformed Jew, if you were to pass away tomorrow, God forbid, would you go to heaven or hell? And based on the Torah, why? That's a good question. Based on the Torah, there's not much speculation. Because here, we're, we Jews care about this world. We don't have a cult of death where all we do is try to figure out what's going to happen next. We care about helping this world. And that's why Jewish people are on the forefront of all the good causes and trying to make the world a better place. Because we care about this world, sir. And I don't, and I don't speculate. You, and I'll tell you, you go to heaven or hell, I'll tell you, according to the Torah? According to the Torah? Torah is going to send everybody to a good place. We don't use fear tactics. Where does it say that? Not true. You have to, it doesn't, like I said, the Torah does not spend a lot of time figuring it out. But it does say that the soul you gave me is pure, and we believe that we're originally created good. We believe also that God Wait, is eternal. Wait, doesn't it say in Deuteronomy and Leviticus that you need to follow all of the rabbinical laws? Therefore, if you haven't, yes, you're in you've trouble. fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans, it tells us all have fallen short of the glory of God. No, no, sir. Yes, it does. If it does, then the, then the Messianic Jews are in serious trouble, much more than I am, because they've obliterated everything and they taught people to do it. Actually, are you going to heaven or hell and why? I want to answer this question. No, I want to answer this question. I get a minute and a half to answer this question. Okay, you, sir, said that, oh, the Trinity is mentioned in Jewish scripture. It says, let us create God in our image. The word God, God is so magnificent that they use a plural form. You're trying to tell me that the Trinity has been true for eons. Since the beginning. Since the beginning. And in the entire Jewish scripture, they never bothered filling it in and they told us the wrong thing. It's three. Why would what? Why wouldn't they ever say, God is one, but there's three parts. Why keep it a big secret? Okay, so, so here, uh, I just want to... You got to translate the Hebrew. And I still want to know if you're going to heaven or not. Okay, so... Could I have somebody else in So here's the point I want to make. When we talk about relying on our own reason, look at how much tension and hostility there is in the room, okay, on both sides. When I mentioned abortion, it wasn't to attack Rabbi Silver. He stands for that passionately, okay? 
Notice these to some people, I was well, the moment I mention abortion, you're going to turn on me. So, so that, here, please hear my point. The point is that we are so passionately having differences about that based on reason. Okay, so I'm not looking to my reason alone to solve things. That's why I'm looking to God and have respect for the Holy Scriptures that have been passed down for centuries and centuries. Last point. Read through the Hebrew Scriptures and see if most of the people are in good standing with God or if most of the time in our history we had problems, okay, in, in ancient history. If that's the case, we shouldn't just pat ourselves on the back and be so sure that we're so righteous. I think it's better to say, God, I've fallen short. I need mercy. Uh, starting with Dr. Brown, we want to have our closing statements. Each speaker will be given five minutes. And I appreciate your patience, and sorry we couldn't get to the additional questions on both sides of the podium. But Dr. Brown, you have five minutes, and when Dr. Brown is completed, Rabbi Silver will be able to close. Yeah, I, I, uh, I very much appreciate all of you coming. I know these are volatile issues. I appreciate the environment we have here in America that both Rabbi Silver and I stand for. And I appreciate your willingness to do the debate, sir, very much. Um, at your request, uh, I went first, which means that you get the closing word on everything. So please hear us both carefully, okay? I have resources available. If you can't afford them, I'm happy to donate them to you. I don't take royalties on those materials. But please hear this. Go to my website, askdrbrown.org. And we have a lot of free links, askdrbrown.org. There's a link on the home page. You can get a lot more information. Look into these issues in further depth. I want to say, number one, that I absolutely know God exists. I know his love. I know his mercy. I know how he transformed me. And I thank God for Jewish good works around the world. If you'll check, by the way, where most hospitals have been built and most orphanages started, it's by followers of Jesus because he follows that pattern of good works to help and save and transform humanity. And that's why he didn't come to start a political revolution, which is why the New Testament would tell people, slaves, be submissive to your masters. But Jesus came saying he brought a message of liberty to the captives. And it's a historical fact, whether it was William Wilberforce in England or, or, or Harriet Beecher Stowe or these, these others, these Christian leaders were the ones that overturned the horrible slave practice and slave trade. It, it's, it's an inevitability because Jesus came with a message of liberation. I want to say, even though you've heard a lot of things spoken, the facts are what they are. The New Testament is clearly attested. The reliability historically is clearly attested. There's even archaeological confirmation that attests to it. There's eyewitness confirmation. If you take the New Testament writings, maybe you never read them for yourself. You ought to read them. You ought to look at them and read them and come to your own conclusions. But I can tell you this, they are accurate reports, okay? The overall clear sense of what happens is there. And if Rabbi Silver's gonna say there's a contradiction between this one and this one, you know, in a court of law, you get four different witnesses, they're all gonna give you their own point of view of the accident. If they tell you the exact same thing in detail, they made the story up, okay? So we get a panoramic picture of who Jesus is because one writer alone could not fully describe him. It's interesting, I quoted many passages, a good number of passages from Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49 and Zechariah 6 and Psalm 110 and Haggai 2 and Malachi 3 and Daniel 9 and other passages that pointed to the Messianic work of Jesus. Not a one of them was rebutted. Not a one of them was rebutted. The fact that the Hebrew Scriptures, not obscure passages, long, full passages. I mean, this is my field, but don't take my word for it because if anyone can get a degree, go read it for yourself. Read a passage like Isaiah 53 for yourself. Read in Hebrew if you can. And say, who is this speaking of? Okay, beginning at the end of the 52nd chapter, it's 15 long verses, anything but obscure. Read the words for yourself. And I'm not here to threaten you with hell and to thunder you. I'm simply asking you a question. Do you know if you're in right relationship with God? That's my question for you. Do you know that you sinned? If you sinned, have your sins been forgiven? Has your life been changed? Are you living to do the will of God? I'm focused on this world because I'm going to another world, so I want this world to count, okay? All of us are here in this world. All of us are going to die. All of us are going to stand before God. It's for you to work that out between you and God. I'm not your God. I'm not your judge. I'm simply saying God has a better way. And the better way is, rather than leaving us to ourselves, Jesus, Yeshua, in accordance with the Hebrew scriptures, came 
and died as a ransom for us all. The righteous one said, I'll pay for what they did because we could never pay for our own sins. I'll pay for what they did. You say we don't deserve it. Exactly. It's an act of extreme mercy because God never wanted the blood of bulls and sacrifices. And he says, I'm the bread of life. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for sheep. I close with the words of the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, Jesus, Yeshua, the guilt of us all. Read the Bible for yourself. I believe the scriptures. I believe in the God of the scriptures. And I commit my case to what's written in the Bible. Thank you. seen a good indication of how the believing mind operates. Believing is a synonym for irrational. I quote Jesus saying that you have to hate your father, hate your brother, hate your mother. And Dr. Brown says that's a paraphrase of Moses where he says, love your neighbor. Is there anything so irrational as to think that? By that type of thinking, if I can even call it that. I didn't say that. I was quoting Deuteronomy 33. I quoted Deuteronomy 33, sir. Can you start my time over, please? Keep going. You'll have that. What is this? How is it that people can't even listen to a conversation? Let me finish my thought. When I read about Jesus saying to hate your father, hate your brother, not once or twice, but repeatedly, he says, well, that's, that's fine and dandy. That's all okay. That's paraphrasing the prophets or whoever. It isn't. If you have a rational mind, you'd say, gee, that's pretty harsh. You'd realize that's a contradiction. You have a choice. You can say it's not God's word, or you can rationalize anything and say, oh, different words on the cross, that's just a different, that's Hebrew logic or Greek logic or something like that. It's all Greek to me because I don't understand what kind of logic it is when you say that people can be crucified on two different days, the day before Passover or the day after Passover, or it rises six and nine and it's all the same thing. It isn't. The fact that somebody has a transforming experience means nothing. If it did, all the Muslims would be telling the truth because they've had a transforming experience that led them to crash planes into buildings. So this transforming experience has nothing to do with whether you're telling the truth or not. The, the Bible clearly says that you cannot kill a son or punish the son for the sins of the father. If you're rational, you would think, that's all I need. There's no such thing as original sin. God's saying, I don't punish the children for the sin of the father. Case closed. He then says they also make everybody responsible for their own sins. Is that just? He's punishing everybody because of something that somebody else did, and he's going to save us because of some punishment somebody else did? And the, when we get all these goodies, if we happen to believe the right thing, and if we guess wrong and we're a great person, then we go to hell? Is that just? Is that rational? This, the, the Christian scriptures have nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus. The, the people who put this together, they told people that you have to submit to all authority. The Christian scripture says repeatedly, submit to all authority. This was put together by a Roman emperor who wanted to control the people, pure and simple. Jewish people will never submit to all authority. The Christian scripture says all authority is of God. Does that mean then that if we live in Nazi Germany or if we live in Iran that we have to obey that authority? Is that what you, is that what fundamentalists believe? Oh no, 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 that's not really what it says. It means something else. Read what it says and you'll realize how silly it is. You can't obey all authority. If we obeyed all authority, there would be no United States. We'd be part of England right now. Bishop Spong said the darkest and bleakest side of the Christian faith is revealed in the Christian's treatment of the Jews throughout history. Anti-Semitism is a terrifying prejudice that is rooted so deeply in the church's life that it's sort of our entire message. Many other people who study Christianity objectively have come to the same conclusion. Jesus said, you judge a prophet by his fruits, the fruits of Christianity. It was adopted by the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire collapsed shortly thereafter. It was made an official religion, and before Christianity started getting going, they destroyed the library in Alexandria, killed the person who was in charge there, because they said, these books are not needed because it's not in the Gospels. We don't need to pay any attention to it. Then they went off and put us into the Dark Ages. Then when this... Finally, the Age of Enlightenment came, and when the religious authority was gone, people started to be able to think for themselves and think freely. Then in this country, when supposedly this was a Christian nation, you had the Bible being used to support slavery, the Bible being used to 
deny women their basic rights. You had the Bible being used to say that we should commit genocide against the Indians, because after all, they did it against the people in the Bible, and that's God's word, and why shouldn't we challenge God's word? I'll tell you why you shouldn't challenge God's word, because it's been used to kill people over and over and over again. So Hitler launched Kristallnacht on the anniversary of Luther's birthday. Why did he do that? Well, maybe because Calvin said their rotten and unbending stiff-neckedness deserves that they be oppressed unendingly without measure. And Luther said that, what shall we do with this damned, rejected race of Jews since they live among us and know about their lying and blasphemy? We cannot tolerate them. We've got to burn down their temples, put them all in one little place. We should treat them with, with, with terror so that the people know that they've been rejected by God. Fundamentalist Christians and all Christians on Yom Kippur, they should be atoning for that one. And stop insisting that God's word is telling people to kill people who don't agree with you. That's a horrible thing. Yes, I believe in the Bible. I believe when the Bible says that we should love each other. I believe that the Jewish people try to show the symmetry and harmony between the universe, and that that symmetry means the fatherhood of God and all human beings are brothers. That's what I believe in. Well, we came to present to you the uh, two opposing views on who is Jesus. It's been an emotional uh, evening, I know that. And why we, um, why we did this was for you to consider uh, both views. And we really appreciate you coming out. And uh, what we wanted to do was for you to take home with you what you've heard and think about it and um, ruminate about it and come to your own conclusions. And uh, again, thank you very much for coming out and being respectful to, uh, to Dr. Brown and to Rabbi Silver.